are listening to the Jersey Guys Podcast, the show that talks about hard rock, heavy metal, AOR, and West Coast music. In-depth conversation and special guests are always on tap, so settle in and turn it up. Now, here are your hosts, Tom and Mark. Hey everybody, Mark from the Jersey Guys Podcast. I'm here with my co-host Tom Coyne as always and today we've got a a brand new episode for you. This time around we're talking with Steve Mann. Uh, Steve's been involved in a lot of great projects over the years, uh, most notably uh, the Macaulay Shanker Group, uh, most recently the Michael Shanker Group. Uh, He also was one of the main men behind uh, the band Lionheart who released a classic album in the mid-1980s. They've also released a couple albums over the last few years, too, uh, as sort of a comeback. And uh, he was involved in a band that came out last year called the Uzi Man Project, which was Chris Uzi uh, from the band Heartland and, of course, Steve Mann. And uh, so we talk about those projects and what else he's got going on today. So let's get right to this interview. It was a good one. So we hope you enjoy this one. Hey, Steve, thanks for joining us here on a podcast tonight. Tom and I appreciate your time. Yeah, you're very welcome. It's great to be here. Awesome. I I really appreciate this. I know when Tom set this up, we were really looking forward to talking to you. Um, You're actually our first European guest that we're talking to on our podcast after a year and a half now. Oh, there you go. I'm very honored. (laughs) So um, I guess we would start off talking about it. You've done a lot of things in your career, and, and there's some things we're, we're not going to touch on because, you know, we like you know we could probably be here for a couple hours. But um, I guess we're going to start off with the part of your career that was uh, Lionheart back in the mid-'80s. Can you talk a little bit about the formation of that band? Yes, I, I um, had just done an audition for the, a band called the Tigers of Pantang, who um, were basically involved in the new wave of British heavy metal movement, which was just picking up at the time and um i didn't get the job as lead guitar player but i came second to, uh, to john sykes and uh, jess cox who was the singer of tigers at the time kept my number and um uh when he left tigers of pantang he got together with uh, dennis stratton who just left iron maiden and uh, and jess gave me a call and said Do you want to get involved in this new project we've got going and um i said yeah you know sounds great so we met up rehearsed uh we then got together with Rocky and uh, Fra- Rocky Newton uh, and Frank Noon, uh, who had been playing with Def Leppard at the time. And that was it. And we just got together, did a rehearsal, and everything worked out really, really well. We knew the chemistry was right. And uh, Jess and, and Dennis were on their way to an interview, and they thought, well, we haven't got a name for the band. <laughs> and they thought, we've got to be able to say, you know, what the band's called. So they just made up a name on the spot, which was Lionheart. Yeah. And, uh, and it's stuck. It's been there ever since. So that's basically how the band got together. But we had a really very, very good chemistry in that in those early days. And we knew then it was going to work very well. Before I ask you my first question, I just wanted to say coming in second to John Sykes is nothing to sneeze at. No. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I didn't feel that way at the time. But anyway, I didn't really know who John Sykes was going to be. Then. In, re- in, ret- in retrospect. In retrospect, it's quite respectable. (laughs) So I wanted to ask you something about that first record, which is at the time, in my opinion, that 84, 85 period of AOR that was coming out of the UK was, there was just so, so many great bands that were coming out of there. And you had a singer by the name of Chad Brown, who I particularly liked a lot of me and Mark were talking about him. What became of him after this album and why wasn't there a second album? Um, okay, Chad, uh, I mean, the band broke up. Um, I mean, Chad had, I think, uh, actually, we didn't really break up. We, we kind of took a, a pause back in 1985, and we had a lot of problems with the management company. The record company had put a lot of uh, money into the band, and they'd gone way over budget, and, you know, it, it's a long story, but... Uh, we were sued by the record company and the management company, and it all got a, a little bit, um, uh, a little bit ugly. Uh, and so we're kind of not really, you know, we just wanted to play the music, and we're just having to see lawyers every day and this kind of stuff. 
And I think Chad just got fed up with it. And, and he was the first to leave the band and said, look, I, I can't take all of this, uh, this legal stuff. I just want to see. And um, we got a guy in uh, called Keith Morell from Mama's Boys. Um, and he was with the band for about six months. Uh, but then it just broke up anyway, um, which was a bit of a shame, you know, because it was all to do with the, the, the whole legal stuff and the administration stuff around the band, which is why the band broke up. Um, but then I think he decided to go into, you know, business of some sort. And uh, when the band got to, got together again back in 2016, we phoned Chad and said, do you want to uh, join this? He said, well, thanks for the phone call, but no thanks. You know, I'm busy with my own business and stuff. So, um, yeah, I, I do very occasionally speak to him, but uh, he left the music business and, uh, and became a businessman. You know, unlike the rest of us, we carried on and, uh, and stayed as musicians, but uh, Chad's doing his own thing. Ah, okay. Now, the, the Lion Heart unearthed Raiders of the Lost Archives, which was a double CD with... What are those songs Ooh. predominantly? Were they for a second album? Were there demos that were not used? What, what was the story behind that, that double album? Yeah, it was both, really. I mean, they were partly because we spent a lot of time. Uh, we had a rehearsal room uh, in London, and uh, we'd meet up there every single day. And uh, we just, you know, while we we're looking for a record deal, um, and it took us about four years to find a record deal with CBS. So in that four years, we just met up every day and we just wrote songs and we recorded them on a little porter studio that we had. And, um, and basically, we had a huge selection of songs for the first album. So inevitably, a lot of those songs had to be left off. And then when we'd done the first album, we then carried on writing, uh, as you say, ready for the second album. And so these were all demos that we put down. And, uh, and we it wasn't our idea to put together that... Um, that compilation album, that Raiders album, we actually heard from Pony Canyon in Japan who said, um, we've heard that you have a lot of demos and we'd be really interested in releasing that in Japan. Mm. Uh, so w we went through all our old cassettes and all of this kind of stuff and we put it all together and uh, we realized we had a double album's worth of, of demos and if I listen to the stuff now, there's some very, very good songs in there. And when we did the Second Nature album in 2016, 2017, um, we went through a lot of those old songs and songs that hadn't made it on the first album, like Prisoner and um, uh, Every Boy in Town, I think there was, and then a few other, a few other tracks uh, that we thought, well, these are good songs, you know. So we, we put them on the Second Nature album in 2016, uh, but that was basically it's just just a you know a way of uh, of finally all of that work that we'd done that four years worth of songwriting and demo recording actually having it out there and it was a lot more successful than we ever thought it was going to be. We thought you know it'd be hardcore Lionheart fans that would buy it, but it actually sold very well in the end. Yeah, I, I remember when it came out. I uh, purchased it. I, did it ever come out anywhere other than Japan, or, or just solely through Pony? Uh, it was never, I think it was only available on import. I think a lot of people did buy it on, on import. Right. Um, but it was never officially released anywhere outside of Japan by any other record company. Uh, so I think the only way to get hold of it was on import. I wanted to ask you, Steve, um, you talked about, you know, the first album came out in 1984, 85, and then the band kind of, you know, broke up or went away. Um, but obviously you did come back. You said 2017, you released Second Nature. And then again, in 2020, you put out uh, The Reality of Miracles uh, as Lionheart. And, uh, you know, the band came back as it was, except, and we talked about Chad Brown not being there, kind of doing the businessman thing and not really being involved in music. How did you find uh, Lee Small, who's a, a brilliant, brilliant singer, sort of the second coming of uh, Glenn Hughes in my mind? <laughs> Glenn Hughes is, is Lee's hero. I mean, he loves Glenn. And, um, and what I've heard, I think Glenn loves Lee. I think it's, it's a kind of reciprocal agreement there or a mutual admiration society going on there. there. Um, but uh, no, we, as, as I say, we asked Chad and he, he turned, turned it down. And I think it was a friend of Rocky uh, who said, do you know this guy Lee Small? He's got a fantastic voice and he's not really doing much. Um, you know, and he deserves a, a bit of a break in, in my view. So, um, so Rocky listened to him and then he phoned me and said, you've got to check this guy Lee out. Um, 
And I think he pointed me towards a couple of YouTube videos, uh, which I listened to. And I, I thought, well, this is a, an absolutely stunning voice. You know, let's hope he's not a, a bit of an ass. <laughs> so he's a nice guy. So uh, we basically, we, we were, the reason why the band got back together again in 2016 was um, the promoters of the Rockingham Festival uh, in the UK were Lionheart fans. And they said, look, would you fancy getting back together again just for one show? And we said, well, why not? You know, so um, we met two days before the festival. The first time we'd seen each other in something like, you know, 20 years or whatever it was. Uh, and Lee turned up and we had no idea what to expect. And, uh, and he walked in, he said, hi, chaps, I'm Lee Small. And straight away we knew, yeah, he's a nice guy, just by the way he said hello. And, uh, and we hit it off with him straight away. And we did, uh, the first song that we played in 20 years was Wait for the Night off the Hot Tonight album. Uh, Lee had learned it and he sung along. We'd get our vocal harmony bits. And, uh, and all of us at the end of it were, were speechless. We just said, that is absolutely amazing. It, it, we knew we had something special going on. And uh, so at that point, yeah, I mean, Lee was a, a firm member of the band. And I have to say, I love Chad's voice. You know, it's fantastic for the 80s stuff. But the way it worked out, it was actually quite fortuitous um, for us. And nothing against Chad at all. But it was quite fortuitous for us that uh, that he turned us down and, uh, and that we ended up with Lee. Because Lee just fits into the band absolutely perfectly. Yeah. Well, it was funny because Tom actually turned me on to the the latest or the last Shy album, which Lee sang on, and and I was just blown away. Yeah, um, I've not really listened to much of, <laughs> of the other stuff he's done, um, so I'm sure it's very good. You know, I mean, he's he has a fantastic voice. I've, I've heard a lot of stuff he's done since he's joined Lionheart, but I haven't listened to his older stuff yet. I must check it out. You have to listen to the the Shy album he was on because it's it, it's a stunning performance, and I'm the biggest Tony Mills fan in the world. I, Tony was like what, maybe my favorite singer, and I was very uh, skeptical of anybody replacing Tony Mills in that band, and and he just right. he knocked it out of the park. I really really suggest you listen to it. You'll be, I mean, you already know how great he is, but he's really puts on a great performance on that album. Yeah. I will, I will check it out. As soon as this interview is finished, I'll check it out. What I wanted to talk to you about now is how did you segue into Michael Schenker? Uh, well, back in the 80s, you mean? Or, yes, or this in the, same in, in, time in the 80s, yes. Yeah, it's a good story to this. Uh, there was a, um, a friend of Rocky's uh, who was a keyboards player and guitar player. I can't remember his name. Um, but he was asked by uh, Michael Schenker to go and do, who knew him somehow, uh, to go and do keyboards and uh, perhaps a bit of guitar on the demos that he was doing back in 1980, whatever it was, 85. And he said, I, I, can't, I can't leave my goldfish um, because it will die. So um, <laughs> I'm going to have to recommend somebody else. And uh, by this point, Rocky had, um, had already flown over and was doing the bass parts for Michael. And so Michael said, well, look, you know, I was rather counting on this guy, but he's got to look after his goldfish. Um, so do you know anybody else? And Rocky said, yeah, I know this guy, Steve, from Lionheart. And Lionheart had just taken a, you know, 20-year hi hiatus. You know, so get him over, give him a try. So the idea was I went over and did the demos. And at the end of the demos, you know, Michael said, well, you know, it's great. And, you know, I know you can play a bit of guitar as well. Do you want to join the band? And I said, yeah, of course. You know, so that's basically how it worked out. It was because this guy didn't want to leave his goldfish. And I've, I've been grateful to him ever since, whatever his name is. <laughs> and that's quite, that is quite a story. <laughs> <laughs> I've never met him, but what I do, I'll buy him a beer. <laughs> <laughs> How did how did Rocky? Uh, I guess I should backtrack. Then how did Rocky actually get hooked up with Shanker? It seemed like it would have been a, a different camp. I can, I can answer this in three words. I don't know. I think you'll probably have to ask Rocky that one. I I've actually no idea. It was you know something like a friend of a friend of a friend. Okay. Of a friend or something, you know. But he opened the door to he opened the door for you. Yes, I I know the goldfish story, but that's as far as it goes. <laughs> Goldfish story was pretty interesting. Yeah. Never quite anything like that. <laughs> that no. makes up for not knowing the rocket story. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. <laughs> so what was it like working on that first album? 
um, which has now become a real seminal album in the Michael Schenker back catalog. Yeah, perfect timing. It was, yeah, one of my favorites for sure. Really put him back on the map big time at, at that time. Yeah, I mean, it was great. You know, I mean, I, I loved every minute of working on that. And we went to, you know, we did the backing tracks in a studio called Puck in Denmark, which is no longer there. But it was basically the studio was in the middle of a, a, a huge field, nothing else around for miles and miles. And, um, and the whole studio was made of glass. And there was Studio One, which we were in, and Studio Two, which George Michael was in, doing the fade out. And, uh, and when we got there, it was early in the year, and it was, had been snowing. And so we were just surrounded by snow. It was absolutely the, the best recording atmosphere you can possibly imagine. And, um, and we're working with Andy Johns, um, rest, rest in peace, you know, God rest his soul. Uh, fantastic producer, obviously, you know, got, he's the man who's associated with the, um, the John Bonham drum sound, of course. Yeah, sure. And, uh, and the whole thing was, was, yeah, was very, very good. We had, you know, a couple of ups and downs here and there, but you do with every album. Um, Unfortunately, I, I, wasn't, I wasn't able to stick around to finish the album because um, my father was very, very ill and, uh, and I left to go back to England and uh, spend some time with my father. And Mitch Perry came in to finish the album. And uh, so I did the rhythm guitar part. So I've done my solos on the album already. Um, but, you know, fair dues, they took the solos off and they put Mitch Perry's solos on instead uh, because obviously he'd uh, come in to join, to, to join the band. Um, but it was, I have great memories of, of doing that album. It was, uh, it was a really yeah, fantastic time. Well, it kind of put Shanka back on the map, uh, on the map and it, it brought Macaulay more to the forefront. I mean, I knew Macaulay from uh, Grand Prix and another band called GMT that he was in, but th- these were bands that really That's weren't right. known in the States at all. It was really his introduction to, uh, the United States audience, you know, unless you were like a, a geek right. like me who had every album back in the day you really didn't know grand prix and gmt but uh this was like his introduction um to the to the u.s market and th- this album I, I i could attest to it the fact i remember the day it came out did very well over here even though it was kind of a different it was a, it was a very americanized sound uh of of michael Schenker compared to what he had done previously would you agree yeah i, I absolutely i would um it was a bit of a conscious effort, I think, by both the management company at the time and the record company at the time uh, to try and break Michael in America. Okay. And um, the record company, if I remember, was EMI. And uh, so that that kind of tending towards more of a, an AOR sound mm-hmm. was very intentional. Um, I don't think Michael was, was kind of 100% happy with it. Um, it he really kind of prefers more the, 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 the European sounding kind of rootsy um, kind of rock sound. But, um, you know, what he played on the album was, was absolutely stunning. I mean, it always is, you know, what he, what he plays is jaw, just jaw dropping stuff. Uh, but I, I, I liked it. I liked that kind of leaning towards the American sound. Um, same with Save Yourself. That had a, a kind of a, a very, you know, AOR, Uh, feel to it as well so um yeah i mean you're absolutely right i mean there there was a definite move to try and you know break america with this more aor sound um which is why i think uh andy johns was brought in and why frank Petty was brought in for the save yourself album well let's move on to that save yourself album uh, 1989 um you actually co-wrote uh the the huge song and it's huge still here in america uh anytime uh with robin you co-wrote that uh brilliant brilliant song I, one of my favorite ballads probably ever and, and you still hear it today here in america it's on all the satellite xm probably daily how how uh how did you come up with that song well thank you for the compliment first of all um there's a, a story which probably betters the goldfish story to this one. It's um, <laughs> basically uh, when I left the band to spend some time with my dad, um, he sadly passed away. And uh, so I thought well, it would be lovely to get back into the band. And I'd heard that um, 
Uh, I think there's a little bit of stress between uh, Mitch and some of the other guys in the band. And, uh, and I think they were kind of up for having a bit of a lineup change again. I think Mitch also, to give him his due, he was very, very much a lead guitar player. I don't think he was 100% happy with being playing second fiddle to Michael. And um, so it kind of set the stage for a return for me to come back into the band. Um, but I decided that uh, it was probably worthwhile just um, providing Michael with a bit of a carrot, you know, a kind of incentive to, to bring me back in. And by this point, I'd actually set up a home studio. And I'd been home recording for about, um, about 14 years by that point. And um, so I was kind of quite accomplished with what I was doing. So I thought, if I say to him, look, you don't need to pay for the demos, I'll bring my recording gear over to Hanover. And, uh, and you can record all the demos on, on my equipment. So I thought what I'll do is just put down a, a, you know, a quick you know, few chords or whatever, uh, put a drum sound over it, bass sound, you know, whatever, uh, and just say, look, this is the sound that you, know, you can get from the studio to, to do the demos with. And um, so anyway, I, I just set the tape machine running. I sat at the keyboard and just played a few chords. Uh, and then I wrote down on a piece of paper what the chords were, played some guitar to it, and, and then overdubbed some drums and uh, a bit of bass, and then sent it off to Robin. I said, can you play that to Michael, just to kind of, you know, so he can get an idea of the sound. And anyway, I didn't hear from Robin for about three days, and then he phoned me and said, oh, well, I've, <laughs> I've written a melody and some words to that song of yours. I said, what song? I haven't written a song. And he said, the one you sent me. I said, it's not a song, Robin. It's just, you know, to play to Michael. And he went, well, I've written these, these words and melody anyway, so can I come up to your studio and put it down? So I said, well, if you insist. So he came up and um, he was just, I think, breaking up with his, his first wife at the time. And so he was a bit kind of emotional. And he came into the studio and he started to sing this song. And I thought, well, that's, that sounds quite good. And then he, he broke down and he said, I'm sorry, you know, can we start again? So I said, sure, no problem. And he sung this song and he got to the end of it and I went, wow. <laughs> I said, that is amazing. And that was any time. Wow. And, um, you know, and I, I thought, yeah, that sounds, you know, you've done a great job with that, Robin. Thank you. And then when we were doing the demos for the, for the Save Yourself album, uh, I, I'd forgotten all about the song. And Robin said, why don't we just throw in that ballad that, that we did? And I went, are you, are you sure it's good enough? And he said, yeah. He said, you know, we'll, we'll do it. So we put it in the pot and we did the demo. And then when Frank Filippetti, the producer of Save Yourself, heard it, he said, that's a fantastic song. He said, that's going to be a single. And I didn't see it. I, I just thought it was, you know, just this bunch of chords that I'd put down. And, um, and it became the, the, the second single. And then, you know, obviously it became a hit in America at that point. <laughs> but that, that ever became a hit record. Yeah. Yeah. I think it became, uh, I think it hit number six here in the U S on the billboard chart, if I'm not mistaken. It, it did. Yeah. That's right. It got up to number six. Yeah. Oh, it's, it's a great, great arrangement. Um, like you said, Robin's vocals were just outstanding on it. I, I, it's always been one of my favorite songs. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. It was, I, I think it's success is probably due to the speed at which we put it down. You know, we didn't think about it. We just went bosh, bosh, bosh. Yeah, and it was down. And I think sometimes with you know songs almost write themselves. Um, you know, when, when you approach them like that. I always found it interesting uh, that Mitch Perry ended up with Shanker, also because being from New York, we were very familiar with him in a band called Talus with Billy Sheehan, mm. and um, he he was quite a guitar hero at the time. He had already established himself as you know like a hot shot. Uh, Van Halen-ish type of guitar player. So I always thought it was kind of odd that he was paired into that band. I didn't know how a guy like that would fit as kind of a quasi-rhythm. Second gu- fiddle. You know, yeah. Mm-hmm. So it's it's not surprised because even at the time, I remember being surprised to see him involved with Schenker's lineup. And it didn't really seem like something that would long-term uh, be a fit. Uh, it, it, to be honest, it wasn't. And I think Mitch knew that, um, and Robin and Rocky and Bodo knew that too. And I think that's why they kind of, it was a mutual agreement that he would move on. And um, you're right. I mean, he, he's an absolutely brilliant guitar player. I mean, just just astonishing. And, um, yeah, and, and he needs to be playing um, 
a lead guitar player's role in a band and not, you know, as you said, playing second fiddle to uh, to another guitar hero. There's not room for two guitar heroes in one band. And, uh, so it, it was, to, to be honest, it was a bit of a mismatch. Yeah, that's, that's we, even back then at the time, we were surprised that, that he was in yeah, the band. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I, I got on great with Mitch and I went over to uh, to LA to teach him the, uh, the songs and... Uh, you know, I, I, I think they got me in a hotel for like about two days and, and we got together and we spent about half an hour running through the songs and he nailed every single one straight away. Mm-hmm. And uh, so I spent the rest of my time sunbathing and swimming. <laughs> uh, so I'm quite thankful he's such a good guitar player. <laughs> so now that there was a third installment of, of the Shanker, um, Robin McCauley uh marriage at the time and that you were not on is is was that by choice or did you have other things going on at the time um i i did have other things going on i by that point i joined a band called the suite and um and i think michael had based himself in los angeles uh, and robin was living there anyway and rocky was living there too and um and i think they were trying to keep costs down for the new album so the idea of flying myself and Bodo over to LA and then putting us up in apartments for however long it took to record the album um, and then flying us back again, I think was just adding to the budget a bit too much. Um, So I think they decided then to use a a local LA based drummer and, uh, and keyboards player. Okay. Um, What I did play on is a song called nightmare on that album, which, um, was actually recorded during the Save Yourself sessions, and I played on that, and it was came out on the album after that, the MSG album. And uh, so there is, so I think it's a, I love that album, and um, uh, so I am actually technically on the album, and I think my name even appears on the album, if I'm not mistaken. Right, and that Nightmare song, I think they actually did on their acoustic album as well, too, if I if memory serves me. That's right. Yeah, that, that was a fantastic track. And there's also on that album, that same album, uh, I think probably my favorite ballad of all time, uh, which is called, um, <laughs> let me think, uh, When I'm Gone. And I think that's one of the most powerful vocals I've ever heard. That got a lot of airplay over in the States too at the time. I had that on a playlist and I, yeah, I've got it on a playlist here and I, I listen to that song even today a lot. It's a fantastic ballad. Yeah, and, and his vocals on that are fantastic. He just knocks it out of the park. Stunning on that song. Yeah. Uh, I, again, I, I think it was uh, you know all to do with what Robin was going through at the time, and so it's you know that that performance is straight from his heart. It's a fantastic performance. Now we know you, you were in Sweet for a while, and and also uh, Eloy. What brought what started the reformation of uh, Lionheart? What brought you guys back together? And um, how did you get a record deal? And what brought the whole thing to the, to the forefront again? Mm, um, well, that, that basically, as I kind of touched upon before, was um, the promoter of the Rockingham Festival in the UK, a guy called Dave, Dave Heron. Um, was a good friend of Rocky, and he always loved Lionheart. And he just had this kind of whim uh, you know, just maybe we can get the the lineup back together again. Uh, and so he mentioned it to Rocky. Rocky phoned all of us and said, do you fancy it? And, you know, we said, of course, you know, let's, uh, Lionheart was a great band, never saw its full potential. Uh, so let's at least get back together again, have a couple of beers and a bit of a laugh and a catch up. And um, we'll get together, you know, day before the, uh, the, uh, the festival and just run through the songs. And um, which is what we did, and uh, and we just thought we'd do the show and then have another beer, say cheerio, and that would be the, the last we'd see of each other for another twenty years. And we got so much feedback on Facebook saying that was absolutely brilliant. You guys have to do an album. That it was very difficult to say no, you know. So we kept in contact with each other and we came together and uh, uh, wrote a bit of material got some old songs off the Raiders album, you know, which were never recorded properly. And uh, we put Second Nature together and, uh, and we enjoyed it a lot. You know, they, the whole, you know, with Lee, uh, working with Lee, and uh, I have a very, very great uh, songwriting relationship with Lee. We really understand each other. And um, so we enjoyed it so much, we just decided to carry on and we did a, a, 
a tour of Spain and Japan, uh, and then started on the the album after that. So uh, it really developed out of nothing. You know, what was supposed to be a one-off gig became a, a band reunion. And the songwriting on this second album was very strong. Even the songs that weren't used on the, yeah. the archives, uh, the new material was very strong. Yeah, I mean, I, I think I'd had uh, 20 more years of experience uh, of songwriting. And you also m managed to cover a, a Beatles song as a, as a Japanese bonus track. Uh, we did. Um, paperback writer, yeah. I, I, I think that was Lee's idea. I think he'd always loved that track. And uh, it was certainly his idea to put all of the, you know, delays on his voice and all that kind of stuff. So we made it a real kind of psychedelic hippie <laughs> uh, type of phrase. I think, I think it worked. It worked really well. I love that. I love that. I think it worked well enough you could have put it on the actual album. I mean, I, did, I have the Japanese bonus. I don't know if it appeared anywhere else, but... Yeah, well, I, well, to be honest, uh, we re-released Second Nature uh, last year, uh, and we remastered it, and uh, we decided to put Mary Did You Know, uh, which had been our Christmas single, on the album as a bonus track, and also we included Paperback Writer. Okay. Um, so the, the re-release that came out last year um, does actually have Paperback Writer on it. So we move on to another Lionheart album, uh, The Reality of Miracles. You could tell us about the uh, the writing process and how that all came about. Uh, yeah, we, we as soon as we finished Second Nature, I'm, I'm one of those people that when, when I'm recording, 100% uh, of my concentration and creativity goes into the recording. Um, the day that it's mastered and goes off to the pressing plant, I lose interest. <laughs> and, um, and my thoughts always turn to, okay, what can I do now? And so as soon as we finished Second Nature, I was, I was thinking about the next album. Um, and so I started putting some ideas together and send, sending them off to Lee. And, uh, and we just really built on the writing relationship that we'd established for Second Nature which we were both very, very happy with. I mean, we, you know, we, we just found our, our kind of little way of working there and, um, uh, and stuck with it. So we developed that for the reality of miracles and uh, where we needed half an album's worth of, of new material for Second Nature, we, uh, we got a complete album of original stuff uh, for the reality of miracles. And um, yeah, we, we, we were just very happy with it. Uh, took a while to get it all together because we're all doing, you know, different projects. I had my Chenka stuff I was doing. Uh, but in between times, when I came off the road, I'd carry on with the Reality of Miracles. And uh, I was very, very happy with the way that came out. And I think the songwriting is kind of one step on from uh, what we're doing with Second Nature. Was it difficult to concentrate on this and also have the Shanker shows going on? Or was, it, was this album recorded, you know, when a time you were off the road with, with uh, Michael? It, it was. Um, back in those days, we were kind of doing, I mean, I'd have like a few weeks break uh, and then be back on the road with Michael. So, yes, it was difficult because um, switching mindsets is not easy. And... Um, you know, the, the mindset that I have when working with Michael is a completely different mindset. It's much more keyboards based. Um, and for the live stuff, obviously, you know, there's a lot of rhythm guitar stuff uh, and playing um, stuff, which obviously is written by Michael, uh, apart from things like Anytime or whatever. Um, and then when I switched my mindset to Lionheart, then, of course, it was my own stuff and everything was, you know, I was the lead guitar player very much. And um, so it was my own project. And, and switching mindsets, um, I, I don't, I can't change quite so quickly. Um, it's like my mood, you know, whatever kind of mood I'm in. I can't, you know, a lot of people can just snap out of a bad mood. And I, I, I can't. And it takes me a long time to kind of swap and change. So, so that was quite difficult. Um, the new album I'm working on now is different because we've actually got like a, a four-month period off, so I can really focus on uh, on the on the new album. But back then, for the re reality of miracles, yes, it, it was quite difficult to come off the road with Schenker and then switch mindset to uh, to Lionheart. Any uh, any ideas when the new Lionheart might come out that you just talked about? 
Yeah, uh, that's a very good question. It's we are, um, all the songs are done. Um, Lee has a little bit more lead vocal work to do. We need to do the backing vocals um, properly. And I mean, I'm, I'm looking at hopefully having the album finished uh, within a couple of months. Um, Schenk is back on the road at the end of, uh, end of April. So I'm really hoping to have the album mastered uh, by that point, and then we're going to start hawking around to record companies. So uh, if we're lucky, I would say that we may even have a release before Christmas. Um, if not, then it will certainly be early 2024. Great. Okay. I, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about a record that I was uh, – really stunned by how great it was. Yeah, I think both of us. Yeah. Uh, at first I thought maybe, you know, a put together project, uh, but it, the Uzi Man album is mm. everybody listening. And I could tell you, uh, <laughs> we're definitely listening. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I want to hear. <laughs> I am assuming Mr. Turk brought, brought the, you two guys together. Uh, Mr. Turk certainly did. And, um, I will, I will hand it to Khalil Turk. He, um, he has some great ideas. And um, he's very, as you know, I mean, he's a good friend of yours. He's, he's very sympathetic uh, to, to the music. You know, he, he's, he's first and foremost a massive fan mm -hmm. uh, of that whole kind of musical genre. Uh, and then secondly, he runs a record company. And, and that's, for me, that's the way around it should be. And that's why I like Khalil so much. Um, and he kept saying to me, look, I've got this guy, this English singer, Chris Uzi, you two would work great together. And I was very busy at the time. And I said, yeah, yeah, Khalil, I'm sure you're right. You know, it's like, it's, you know, we'll give it a go sometime. And you know what Khalil's like? He's very, very insistent. He said, look, you've got to write some stuff for, for Chris and see what, what he comes up with. So I thought, okay, just to stop Khalil going on, <laughs> uh, I sat down one afternoon and I, I wrote a track. Uh, which was the uh, the first track on the album, which is Built for the Fight, if I, if I remember. No, it's not Built for the Fight. Um, the, f the flag is, the first track is The Flag. <laughs> That's right. The first, it used to be uh, Built for the Fight, but then they changed, we changed it around. So anyway, the first track I wrote for, uh, for Chris was Built for the Fight. And uh, so I sent it to him and then kind of forgot about it. And then he sent me the vocal back and I put it down on the, uh, on the backing track. And, uh, and then I realized, I thought, wow, this is actually working very, very well. So I started paying more attention to it and uh, started writing some more tracks. And every time he came back with something, again, it was a bit like the relationship that the songwriting relationship I had with Lee, it developed as it went along. And by the time we'd, uh, we got 12 tracks together, Chris and I were, had a really great understanding uh, to the point where Khalil said, right, you know, you've got to do a second album at some point, um, which would be very nice. Uh, so yeah, that's how that came together. That was very much a, um, a, a Khalil Turk production. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> Were you unaware of Chris or, cause he dated back all the way to Virginia Wolf in the early to mid eighties. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I have to say, yes, I was completely, I was blissfully unaware of Chris. Same way I was blissfully unaware of Lee. Um, I'm, I'm very much, I'm not so much of a music listener. I'm not one of those people that kind of checks out bands and, you know, thinks, oh, yes, they're my favorite band or I really like this band. Um, I, I tend not to do that. I, um, I, I kind of tend to spend my time creating uh, rather than listening, you know. So I, I'm not really up on, you know I, know, I know a few bands that I really enjoy listening to, like Dynasty and Battle Beast. You know, I love a lot of the new symphonic metal bands. Nightwish is another you know, favorite band, but I'm not really up on the whole scene, you know, so um, I don't really kind of catch up on, uh, you know, Virginia Woolf or Shy or, um, you know, any of these, these other bands. I kind of tend to spend my time, if I have a bit of spare time to involve myself in music, I prefer to sit down in the studio and create something rather than listen to something. Because Chris has been with Khalil, I want to say about 27 years now since... Yeah, Khalil put out the second Heartland album. Uh, Chris had done an album called Heartland, which did pretty well at the time. Yes, and um, from there on in, I'm from the second album going forward. 
he was with Khalil right up to date and, you know, projects, solo albums, uh, a lot of Heartland mm-hmm. albums. He's kind of been, you know, one of Khalil's main guys for like about three decades now. Yeah, I have checked out Chris's stuff since we were together and uh, listened to Heartland and I love Heartland. I mean, that was uh, uh, fantastic. I mean, the songs were fantastic and the production was great too. And uh, so I do enjoy listening to that, that um, stuff as well. And he had a guitar player back then called Steve Morris. I don't know if you know him. Uh, I do know Steve, actually. I, I've actually got together with Steve fairly recently uh, to, to work on some stuff. And, um, you know, the, the Khalil, obviously, as you know, has a, a huge base of musicians. Mm-hmm. And uh, he just likes to, to get them all together, you know. So one week he'll say, right, you know, do you want to work with Steve Morris and, you know, Steve Overland or whatever? And um, so I've just been doing some stuff with them. And then next week he'll put me together with somebody else. So I, I have to say, I have to really thank Khalil for kind of introducing me to a lot of the people that I'm working with at the moment. And it's, and it's a lot of fun. You know, I really uh, enjoy just that variation of doing different types of music uh, week in, week out, you know. So, um, yeah, so uh, funny enough, you know, you mentioned Steve Morris. I've just been working with him on some, some other stuff the other week. He's a tremendous player. I always like that guy's playing a lot. Very fiery type of player. Oh, it is. It's great. You know, I mean, I've listened to the um, the solos he's he's been doing, and it's fan- fabulous. Yeah, great rhythm player too. Yeah, and he was he was with uh, Chris for quite a long time. He, he's played on other things too, but uh, really terrific player. Yeah, I'm, I'm slowly, I'm slowly catching up with all of this. <laughs> well, if you if you talk to me and Khalil enough, we could fill your heads up with. That's how I met him, actually, like 30 years ago. We, he was writing for a magazine at the time called AOR Classics, and I was writing for a magazine called Bo- Boulevard, and um, we kind of somehow or another crossed paths, and we started talking on the phone, and uh, I visited him in the 90s when I was in the uh, the UK, and. Uh, we've always remained in contact and to this day we still swap ideas what do you think of this what do you think of that you know he'll call me up out of the blue right, and yeah. uh, he's he's a great fan of music as as am I, myself and that's what we've always shared the the, the yeah. love the love of great melodic hard rock and AOR mm. well for, funnily enough just um, sticking with Khalil, Khalil for a second he uh, his he always said his favorite band was Liar um, oh, wow. And I was in Liar back in 1977 to 79. Right. And Khalil saw it when we were playing support to UFO in the UK when they were doing their Strangers in the Night tour. And, uh, and he, caught, he caught us in Liar, and he said since he saw Liar supporting UFO back in 1979, um, Liar became his favorite band of all time. Uh, and so that's how he got in contact with me. He kind of checked me out. Uh, I think on social media or something, and um, uh, I managed to to find my contact, and that's how we kind of got to know each other. Oh wow! And but I, I love him. You know, he's he's a he's a very very warm, sincere guy. I, I really yeah, no, he's a, a genuine guy. He tells you how he feels, and uh, you know, the chips fall where they may from there. But <laughs> <laughs> his ears are going to be burning right now. I tell you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Tom, Tom will expect a call from him tomorrow. <laughs> 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 well let, let's go back you you talked about we earlier talked about your uh, involvement with michael shanker and uh, the macaulay shanker group but now let's fast forward um back at the end of i guess it was around 2016 17 michael uh, gave you a call mm-hmm. again to to join him back up with him how did you get involved with that again um exactly as you say i mean i was um sitting there minding my own business and then uh, the phone rang and it was Michael saying he's putting together a new project and um, he wants to, I think the idea for the project originally came together when in Temple of Rock with Doogie, they played a show together with Alcatraz, uh, which, um, or it might have been the Graham Bonnet band, I'm not too sure. And, uh, and Gra- Graham came on stage in the Schenker cassette to do a guest spot. And I think Michael at that point thought, hmm, actually, wouldn't it be nice to go back through my history? So he had this incredible idea to get all of his singers into one band 
and do a show that went from the very beginnings with Gary right the way through uh, to the stuff with, with Robin and then later with Doogie. And, um, and I think his idea was that he wanted to get kind of musicians from back in that period as well. So I'd last played with Michael in 19, around 1990 uh, and then lost contact with him. And he just thought, well, I'll, I'll, you know, Wayne's, Wayne Finley has been playing with Temple of Rock and everything. And I think he just fancied a bit of a change with the lineup. And so he got Chris Glenn in, uh, Ted McKenna and myself who had played with him, you know, all three of us had played with him in the 80s and, uh, and put, the, put the, the thing together. And then I, I think um, I kind of developed over the years in such a way that um, I kind of assumed the role in this new version, uh, which was kind of very supportive of what Michael was doing. I mean, I, you know, my main, I obviously had Lionheart where I was doing the lead guitar stuff. And so my main role in, in this was to kind of really support what Michael's doing and to kind of, you know, so my rhythm guitars were very much kind of complementing what he was playing. And we'd, we'd often sit down together and just kind of run through the songs and, and say, okay, you play this and I'll play this. And, you know, we had a very, very, or we still do, have a very, very good working relationship with each other. And um, I think he kind of relies on me because uh, I'm, I'm classically trained. Um, so I think he relies on me when I'm working, we're working with singers and things for harmonies and working out harmony parts and stuff like that. And um, yeah, so I've kind of, you know, I, I've stayed the course, if you like, uh, over the last uh, seven years um, since the band first re got back together. And um, yeah, it's great. I, I love it. I've kind of really found my, my slot in the band. You know, I, I love my role in the band a lot. Yeah, great. I just wanted to ask one question that was on my mind. Uh, I was a, a huge Paul Raymond fan, and you now basically fill the the void or, or or the role of of Paul Raymond. Was that somebody that you were? Uh, did, did you really were you familiar with him from from back in the day and all the time? I mean, he was really spent a lot of time with Shanka over the years. Do you? Yeah. Did you have to like kind of fill his role, or did Shanka kind of like leave you to you know create your own identity, so to speak? No, we we, um, we we made a, a conscious decision that when we played the old songs, the old UFO songs, for example, or the um, the MSG songs that Paul was a part of, um, that we would replicate those songs as closely as possible. So I deliberately, you know, got the keyboard sounds that Paul used to have. I mean, obviously, you know, these days we have uh, much better uh, keyboard stuff. I mean, back then it was very, very much a Paul Hammond and like an Oberheim or something, I'm not too, too sure. Um, so you're kind of very limited with the, the sounds that you can get. Um, but, you know, perhaps these days I may have got, you know, been able to get better sounds for the songs, but that wasn't the point. We wanted to reproduce the songs exactly as they were back in those days, using the gear that was available to Paul back in those days, which was, the, you know, the Hammond and, and the Oberheim. Right. And um, so that was, so in that sense, yes, I did step into, into Paul's shoes. Um, but then obviously for the, the stuff that we've done since then, for the, the new albums and the later, later albums, uh, then I, you know, I was very much able to kind of do my, take my own approach to it and, and use my sounds and, uh, and my keyboard style. So, um, so it's kind of 50, 50, you know, okay. it's like, um, uh, partly stepping into his shoes and partly being able to do my own stuff, which I love, you know, I, because what Paul played, you know, uh, was fantastic. You can't fault it. So I was very happy to to reproduce what he'd done. Yeah. Well, um, well, Steve, uh, Tom and I appreciate your time today, but uh, we're looking forward to uh, a brand new uh, Lionheart, as you said. Um, and then you're obviously going to get back on the road with uh, Michael Shanker. Anything else that you got maybe coming up in the, the near future that you could talk about? Um, <laughs> well, there's, I, I, for about 40 years, 50 years, I've been saying I'm going to do my solo album. Ah. And it's, it's kind of slowly coming together by accident. It's, um, I'm, I'm a big lover of classical music, and uh, I just took a classical piece by Samuel Barber, you know, it's a, an adagio, it's a slow classical piece, and uh, played it on uh, my guitar with a device called an Ebo. It makes the guitar sound a bit like a cello okay. and um, a very, very expressive thing. And so I, I recorded that and I did a YouTube video for it. And then I did another one and I'm on my fourth one now. And 
I'm starting to get a lot of great feedback from people saying, you know, this is really good. It's very, you know, we love the stuff that you're doing. And uh, so I've decided that I'm going to do a whole album of that. <laughs> um, so it's a very different different approach to music. You know, as I say, it's, it's very much uh, symphonic orchestra based, um, you know, which I, I have symphonic orchestra plugins, which I, I use and do this Ebo guitar over the top. And it's quite a unique sound, I think. And uh, yeah, so, so keep a lookout for that. That hopefully will probably come out in 2024, but I'll be releasing a lot of new stuff to, um, to my YouTube channel uh, in the meantime. So um, yeah, keep a lookout for that. Great. Is, uh, where can people keep up? Is it the uh, steveman.net? Uh, steveman.net is, is a bit antiquated, but it has got, um, has got all my other links on there. So it's got my, all my social media, link, uh, social media links like Facebook and Instagram and uh, Twitter. So if people go to steveman.net, then they can then link through to all of my other sites. Gotcha. Great. All right. Well, um, again, Tom and I appreciate your time tonight, Steve. Uh, really, really enjoyed this conversation and uh, we hope you did too. Excellent. Well, thank you, Tom. Thank you, Mark. And uh, it's been a lot of fun talking to you guys. My Great. pleasure, Steve. Thank you. Take care. Talk soon. Okay. Yep. Take care. Bye.